From Pacifica, <clears throat> this is Democracy Now! The MEK is an organization of Iranians, both inside Iran and outside Iran, that opposes the current regime, favors government in Iran that is organized along democratic, secular, non-nuclear lines, a democratic, secular, non-nuclear republic. And I should add, this is not one of the few organizations of Iranians that fits that description. It is, in point of fact, the only one. Our men in Iran, new revelations. The Bush administration secretly trained an Iranian opposition group on the State Department's list of foreign terrorists. We'll speak with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hirsch of The New Yorker magazine. Then to Egypt, Omar Suleiman, Mubarak's longtime spy chief, has announced he's running for president, sparking alarm and outrage. I call all fellow presidential candidates to sit together. We have to work together to save the democracy and protect the revolution from the return of Mubarak number two. We'll speak with Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif abdel -Kadus. He's just back from Cairo to accept the Izzy Award, named for I.F. Stone, for his reporting on the Egyptian revolution. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Hopes of a United Nations-sponsored ceasefire in Syria are receding, as Syrian troops continue to shell the city of Homs and the northern village of Marea. The French foreign ministry said Syria's promises to implement a ceasefire plan are a, quote, blatant and unacceptable lie, as the deadline for Damascus to implement the ceasefire plan crafted by U.N. Arab League envoy Kofi Annan ran down. Syria demanded guarantees from the former United Nations chief that armed insurgents would honor a truce. The rebel Free Syrian Army has said it will cease fire only if convinced that Bashar al-Assad's forces have pulled back. On Monday, at least five people, including two Turkish citizens, were wounded by cross-border fire into the Syrian refugee camp in Turkey. Another neighbor of Syria's, Lebanon, condemned the killing of a local journalist by Syrian soldiers firing over the border Monday. Ali Shaban worked as a cameraman for Lebanon's Al Jadid television channel. Salama Abu Majahed is director of TV operations at the station. He's a martyr for all the media. He's another martyr for all photojournalists and for the country. As a television station, we are proud that we had a member in our team like him. May God bless his soul. In other news from Syria, Human Rights Watch has released video of a Syrian refugee describing military attacks on civilians. And in front of us, they started to beat them with the butt of their Kalashnikovs. They started beating their bodies, their legs, and their heads. After they tortured them and all that, a general and a lieutenant general came and gave the order to open fire on the soldiers dissenting from the Syrian army. They started to shoot at them. There were about four soldiers, and each shot about 30 bullets. On Monday, Human Rights Watch released a report titled In Cold Blood, Summary Executions by Syrian Security Forces and Pro-Government Militias. This is Tom Porteous of Human Rights Watch. These are very serious uh, abuses. They are violations of uh, international human rights law. Uh, and um, uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complete shame that uh, this kind of thing is, is taking place. Some of the incidents that we've documented are really quite blood-curdling. U.S. military officials have quietly admitted the U.S. Special Operations Forces will continue to conduct night raids on Afghan homes without the approval of the Afghan government. The admission comes just days after the United States and Afghanistan signed an agreement placing restrictions on the raids. Navy Commander John Kirby admitted Monday U.S. Special Operations Forces can still carry out searches and detain Afghan residents without a warrant from the Afghan government. The European Court of Human Rights has ruled Britain can send five suspects to the United States to face terrorism charges. Lawyers for the suspects had argued their human rights could be breached if they were convicted in the United States. But the court decided sending the men to high-security U.S. prisons would be lawful and that they would not receive inhuman and degrading treatment.
Huffington Post reporting a federal bankruptcy judge in Louisiana has ordered Wells Fargo to pay $3.1 million in punitive damages, one of the biggest fines ever for mortgage servicing misconduct. Judge Elizabeth Magner characterized Wells Fargo's behavior as highly reprehensible. She wrote, quote, Wells Fargo has taken advantage of borrowers who rely on it to accurately apply payments and calculate the amounts owed. But perhaps more disturbing is Wells Fargo's refusal to voluntarily correct its errors. A new report by Citizens for Tax Justice has revealed the names of 26 major U.S. corporations that paid no federal income tax between 2008 and 2011. The list includes General Electric, Verizon Communications, Boeing, PG&E, Duke Energy and Con Ed. A Pakistani lawyer who represents victims of U.S. drone strikes has been forced to cancel a trip to the United States after the U.S. government failed to grant him a visa. Shahzad Akbar was scheduled to speak at an international drone summit in Washington, D.C., later this month. Akbar's co-founder of the Pakistani human rights organization, Foundation for Fundamental Rights. He filed the first case in Pakistan on behalf of family members of civilian victims. I think uh, people are scared. They're definitely scared. I've seen some people. I've seen, I've interviewed some neighbors whose uh, next door house was hit. And I could feel that what's what they are feeling, because they are feeling this imminent threat, and they are actually uh, feeling helpless at the same time, because they have no other place to relocate, because they have, uh, a lot of them have no skills, they have no education, so they, can, they cannot relocate in any other part of Pakistan. While Shahzad Akbar has traveled to the United States in the past, he's not been granted permission to return since becoming an outspoken critic of drone attacks in Pakistan. The special prosecutor investigating the shooting death of the unarmed Florida teenager Trayvon Martin has ruled out using a grand jury in the case, meaning her office alone will decide whether to charge shooter George Zimmerman with a crime. The decision means Zimmerman will not be charged with first-degree murder, a serious charge that would indicate the crime was premeditated and would require the convening of a grand jury in Florida. The special prosecutor, Angela Corey, said her decision, quote, should not be considered a factor in the final determination of the case. Meanwhile, George Zimmerman has launched his own website in an attempt to raise money for what he described as his living expenses and legal defense. The site contains photos of pro-Zimmerman slogans, including a sign at a rally by Quran-burning pastor Terry Jones and a photo of a vandalized black cultural center at Ohio State University, where someone spray-painted the words, Long Live Zimmerman. Every page on Zimmerman's website includes this quote from Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. In media news, a Fox affiliate in Florida is facing criticism after it referred to a neo-Nazi group as a, quote, civil rights group in a report about Trayvon Martin's killing. Here is part of the Fox report that includes an interview with Jeff Shope of the National Socialist Movement. There's another civil rights group in town, the National Socialist Movement. A lot of uh, people in the community, in the white community down there, had been contacting us out of concern for their safety just because of racial tensions. Racial tensions after 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. Zimmerman is claiming self-defense and has been in hiding now for weeks. We're a white civil rights organization, and, uh, you know, we go into areas where, where we're needed and where white citizens are. Uh, need our help. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the National Socialist Movement has its roots in the original American Nazi Party. It's now one of the largest neo-Nazi organizations in the country. The group openly idolizes Adolf Hitler and calls for the deportation of every non-white person in the country. Two white men accused of shooting five black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, killing three of them, have reportedly confessed to authorities. Tulsa police say 19-year-old Jake England has admitted to police that he shot three of the victims, and 33-year-old Alvin Watts has said he shot two others. Police said the suspects drove through the streets of North Tulsa, a predominantly black neighborhood, and randomly shot pedestrians. Both men were ordered held on bail of more than $9 million during their first court appearance Monday. The family of a 22-year-old woman, who was fatally shot last month by an off-duty police officer in Chicago, has filed a wrongful death lawsuit. A lawyer for the family of Rekia Boyd said Detective Dante Servin shot Boyd and a man she was with after getting into an argument with the man, 39-year-old Antonio Cross. The lawyer said neither victim was armed. Police originally claimed Antonio Cross had pulled a gun, but no gun was found at the scene. Rekia Boyd was shot in the back of the head, died a day later. 
There's a new development in the case of the police killing of 68-year-old Kenneth Chamberlain, the former Marine who was killed in his own home in White Plains, New York, after a medical alert. According to an autopsy report obtained by Juan Gonzalez of The New York Daily News, Chamberlain died from a single bullet that entered his right arm and ripped through both lungs. A lawyer for Chamberlain's family said the autopsy contradicts the police account of his death. Police say Chamberlain was holding a butcher knife when police officer fired two shots to stop him. But an attorney for Chamberlain's family says the trajectory of the fatal bullet suggests Chamberlain was neither facing the police nor holding up a weapon. For our complete coverage of the killing of Kenneth Chamberlain Sr., you can go to our website at democracynow.org. President Obama welcomed Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff to the White House Monday. Obama praised Brazil for its rapid economic growth. It gives me an opportunity as well to uh, remark on the extraordinary progress that uh, Brazil has made under the leadership of uh, President Rousseff and her president, uh, her predecessor, uh, President Lula, uh, sh moving from uh, dictatorship to democracy, uh, embarking on an extraordinary uh, growth path, lifting millions of people out of poverty, uh, and becoming uh, not only a leading voice in the region, uh, but also a leading voice in the world. Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff criticized U.S. monetary policy, saying it's harmed Brazil and other developing countries. She said the U.S. decision to leave benchmark lending rates near zero has created an overload of speculative money that floods into economies like Brazil. Essas políticas monetárias, such expansionist monetary policies in, in of themselves, in isolation, no que se refere a políticas fiscais, regarding the fiscal policies, levam à desvalorização das moedas dos países emergentes, ultimately lead to a depreciation in the value of the currency of developed countries, levando ao comprometimento do crescimento dos países emergentes, thus impairing growth outlooks in emerging countries. Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff is a former Brazilian guerrilla who was held for nearly two years in prison and tortured. Wisconsin Republican Governor Scott Walker has privately signed a series of controversial bills aimed at curbing access to abortion and sex education. The first bill bans most abortion coverage under policies obtained through a health insurance exchange set to be created under the Obama administration's health care reform law, allowing coverage only for rape, incest or medical necessity. A second bill requires every woman seeking an abortion to meet privately with a doctor and undergo an exam before the procedure, so the doctor can ensure she is not being pressured. Doctors who violate the law could be charged with a felony. A third bill requires teachers in schools that offer sex education to stress abstinence and say they no longer need to address contraception. Wisconsin's current law requires some instruction on birth control options. Walker signed the bills Thursday, but did not announce the move until the next day, on Good Friday, when his office released a list of about 50 bills he'd recently signed. Democrats slammed Walker for signing the laws in private and for attacking the rights of women. Among the other bills Walker signed was a repeal of the state's Equal Pay Enforcement Act, which gave women and other marginalized groups more power to fight wage discrimination. According to the Wisconsin Alliance for Women's Health, women in Wisconsin make 75 cents for every dollar men earn. Regulators have discovered some nail polishes found in California salons contain high levels of substances known to cause birth defects, despite carrying labels that identify them as being free of certain toxic chemicals. A report due to be released today found 10 out of 12 products that claimed to be free of the chemical toluene actually contained it, with four products containing a dangerously high level. The report says nail products could harm thousands of people who work in California nail salons, as well as their clients. And the Environmental Protection Agency has denied a bid by an environmental group to revoke approval of the weed killer 2,4-D, one of the most widely used weed killers in the world. The National Resources Defense Council has said the weed killer may cause cancer, hormone disruption and other problems, and that the APA has underestimated how much people might be exposed to the chemical. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.
in what appears to be a first for U.S. foreign policy. New revelations have emerged that the Bush administration secretly trained an Iranian opposition group, despite its inclusion on the State Department's list of foreign terrorists. Writing for The New Yorker magazine, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hersh reports U.S. Joint Special Operations Command trained operatives from mujahideen e khalq or MEK, at a secret site in Nevada beginning in 2005. According to Hirsch, MEK members were trained in intercepting communications, cryptography, weaponry and small unit tactics at the Nevada site up until President Obama took office. The MEK has been included on the State Department's list of foreign terrorist groups since 1997. It's been linked to a number of attacks spanning from the murders of six U.S. citizens in the 70s to the recent wave of assassinations targeting Iranian nuclear scientists. Although the revelation that the U.S. government directly trained the MEK comes as a surprise, it's no secret the group has prominent backers across the political spectrum. Despite its designation as a terrorist organization by the State Department for 15 years, a number of prominent former U.S. officials have been paid to speak in support of the MEK. The bipartisan list includes two former CIA directors, James Woolsey and Porter Goss, former Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge. New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, former Vermont Governor Howard Dean, former Attorney General Michael Mukasey, former FBI Director Louis Free, former U.N. Ambassador John Bolton, and former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell. Last month, Rendell and other unnamed officials were subpoenaed by the Treasury Department over their ties to MEK. Mukasey and Free have retained former Clinton administration Solicitor General Seth Waxman to, in response to the Treasury Department probe. Rendell, meanwhile, has shrugged off the scrutiny, speaking at a public event in support of the MEK Friday in Washington, he told the crowd, quote, I never knew obtaining a subpoena from your own government would be so much fun. Well, for more on the U.S. and its ties to the MEK, we're joined by Seymour Hirsch in Washington, D.C. His new piece for The New Yorker is called Our Men in Iran. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now!, Cy Hirsch, oh, and happy birthday. Oh, yes, that's right. It's great to be older. <laughs> well, um, We'll focus on the wiser part. Tell us what you have learned. Who are, as you call it, our men in Iran? <laughs> they are, as you said, they're the MEK. And by the way, again, once again, Amy, the piece was on the New Yorker blog, not in the magazine. It's a shorter piece. And uh, But anyway, the point is, it went through the same sort of intense checking as anything in the New Yorker, of course. Um, uh, simply, they're just um, the Kolk, the MEK. Uh, they, we began to. Um, I learned about this many years ago. It's just one of those things that that it never quite occurred to me how important it was. And and um, what is important about also the they did stop. There's no question. This sort of training that was going on. It was going on at a place called the uh, uh, the uh, Nevada uh, uh, Nuclear Security or National Security Test Site. It's a former site for World War uh, post World War II uh, nuclear testing of weapons, testing of nuclear weapons. And it's off limits to people. And it's, there's an air base there. God knows what went on there. My own guess is rendition flights also flew into that air base uh, in 02, 03. There's some evidence for it. But certainly the uh, groups of MEK were, were flown in secretly. Uh, by, um, I, I presume, uh, the Joint Special Operations Command. This is this new high-powered group that's been doing all the night raids in Afghanistan that also came up in your news uh, broadcast. Um, what's important to me about it is not only uh, that it did end this kind of direct training of uh, this group that is, as you said, a terrorist group, uh, it's also very clear that the United States is still involved, as is Israel and as was for many years uh, England. Uh, in using the MEK and other dissident groups inside Iran as surrogates um, uh, for uh, the continued pressure we're putting covertly on inside of uh, Iran. And that is, uh, as you said, there are assassinations done by the MEK. And let me make it clear, the MEK has been in a virtual war with uh, um, the, uh, the mullahs in, in Iran since, uh, since the fall of the Shah. And you don't have to you don't have to urge them to kill anybody. They're very eager to do it themselves inside that country. Uh, but still, nonetheless, we provide intelligence. Uh, we, the Americans, have continued to provide intelligence and other kinds of material support uh, for the MEK. Don't forget, they speak Farsi, which is a great asset to us. These are people who are able to translate uh, intercepted communications uh, inside Iran for us very quickly and very with great skill. And so we have a lot of reason to uh, rely on them, as we rely on other dissident groups inside Iran, the Kurds, the Azeris, and others, to cause 
um, basically uh, to try and keep some sort of internal chaos and mayhem going inside the country. Is it believed the MEK were involved in the uh, assassinations of the Iranian nuclear scientists? Well, nobody has a video of it, but that seems clear that one of their goals, obviously, is to uh, prevent the uh, um, the Iranians from developing nuclear weapons. And it's not clear who they're really assassinating, whether they're— I know there at one time, my government—I wrote about this in The New Yorker many years ago, in 05 or 06, that we've been actively involved, uh, beginning in the uh, Cheney-Bush days. Uh, of, um, uh, of encouraging insurrection inside Iran. I, I, whether it's aimed at regime change or not isn't clear. I doubt that. But basically, uh, blowing up things, et cetera. Uh, we did have a list at one time we created here in Washington of, of people we'd like to see gone, uh, captured perhaps, turned over, or turned into a, a, our agents, double, you know, double, uh, double agents inside Iran. We tried to do that, too. Um, um, but certainly, uh, the Israelis are pawing the ground as if they're directly responsible or, or deeply involved with the MEK and the recent assassination of a 32-year-old scientist whose role in terms of uh, uh, there's not much evidence he was involved in making weapons because the, there's no evidence that Iranians are making weapons. Can you talk about the bombs that were used in the assassinations? Well, they're most interesting bombs. They're limpet bombs, marine limpet bombs. They're designed—they have a special charge, and they're designed to uh, go in inside. They blow inside. And uh, they're, of course, of great use by the Navy SEALs. And the Navy SEALs, um, for, if you're going to do an underwater demolition, if you're going to blow up a ship from underwater, which is the SEALs traditionally were trained to do, most of them are involved in day-to-day -day combat in uh, in Afghanistan, et cetera, and much different from their initial role of uh, underwater stuff. But if you want to blow up something underwater, you have to have a charge that blow, explodes in, inward to cause water to rush in, et cetera. And uh, these kind of very sophisticated charges have been used by the MEK uh, in the assassinations. And the, the reason we know it is that the, the, uh, the car that was hit, for example, in January uh, in, uh, in Tehran that killed the young scientist or the nuclear physicist, or whatever he was, uh, exploded inward. Um, you can argue this is also good because it, it, it avoids uh, non-combatant deaths. You know, you don't want to kill a lot of people other than the one you're trying to kill. And it's also useful because you make sure anybody in that car gets it because it go, does blow inside. It's a very sophisticated shape charge, and there's no question that um, some of the best minds in the Navy uh, mind-making business, where some of that information was obviously passed on, whether directly um, to the MEK or through um, Israeli assets, or ex explicitly how. But the, the, it's not an accident that these kinds of sophisticated weapons uh, can be traced to the uh, Navy SEALs, who are a major element of the Joint Special Operations Command. Interestingly, you end your piece by quoting uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta at Fort Bliss in Texas, um, acknowledging the U.S. has some ideas as to who might have been involved, but we don't know exactly who was involved, you know, being questioned about—this um, uh, was the day after, a few days after the assassination by, uh, of the Iranian nuclear scientist. He said, I can tell you one thing, the U.S. was not involved in that kind of effort. That's not what the United States does. Well, I think that's technically correct. I, I don't think there's any other way to read that that comment as as uh, or the the use of that last graph as as an ironic statement, perhaps. Uh, I, I think it's correct that um, uh, I, also it's to my knowledge um, this isn't in the piece because um, um, uh, only one particular source about it, but. Um, I do understand that we really don't know what's going to happen till after it happens, and then we are put on notice. We do get notice that something's happened before it's released to the public. We have that kind of communication, um, uh, essentially through Israel. Israel's obviously a little closer to everything that's going on than we are, but we're certainly— um, uh, uh, we're not picking targets. I, I doubt that now. I, I, uh, at least I don't have any evidence we are. But we're providing general intelligence, and it's not an accident that the um, the first units of the MEK to show up in, in, in Nevada, late 04, early 05, and it was months and months of training. It's not—the uh, the first word used by two different people about it was commo, communications and crypto. The point is that um, um, there was a story in The Washington Post just the other day here uh, de describing how America has been using drones to overfly Iran for at least three years. I, I would argue that 
long before that, we've been using American satellites flying high that can't be detected. And obviously, you can uplink and downlink communications to satellites. You can, uh, if you're on the ground and you find out something very useful technically, by training the MEK in uh, communications and how to use uh, encrypt communications, you're also enabling them to become an asset on the ground for us. Um, there was a period, I would say, in the Bush administration, I also think it stopped under Obama when our boys, our Joint, Joint Special Operations Command guys, were directly inside Iran. We came in through uh, Herat in Afghanistan. We also uh, that was one of the, what we call a rat line. There are other rat lines through Balochistan in in, uh, in Pakistan and uh, et cetera. There were ways to get inside Iran um, clandestinely that we've been using uh, for at least since I'd say late '04 until probably right before Bush, uh, Obama got in. Uh, so we were there. Look, it's been a huge, big internal game uh, designed to destabilize. And as somebody said to me, and, and, uh, and one of the pieces, one of the quotes in the pieces, we're not necessarily looking for Einsteins. Uh, I, I, that suggests to me that the, the scientists are really the most deeply involved in the enrichment. And by the way, let me say again, there is no evidence that our intelligence community or even the Israeli intelligence community has, and I know that firsthand, suggesting that there's an ongoing bomb program. So we are now, the United States is now in the position of increasing sanctions and pressuring uh, all sorts of economic pressure on uh, the Iranians to stop. The whole purpose of the economic sanctions is to stop the Iranians from um, making a bomb that we know they're not making. Uh, once again, I don't know how we get into this convoluted position. And, and then, as, as readers of the, uh, of the uh, major newspapers know, we are now also uh, uh, entering new talks with Iran. Uh, with new preconditions and basically telling them that they must stop doing enriching uh, what they are legally uh, entitled to do as members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It, 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 Iran may be secretly wanting a bomb, and they may have that passion, and they may be, uh, you know, dream about it at night, uh, but we haven't a shred of evidence that they've done anything. In concretely, physically, to create a facility for, for making a weapon. We're talking to Seymour Hirsch. We're going to come back to him in 30 seconds, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who's written a piece for The New Yorker online called Our Men in Iran. Stay with us. هیچ کدوممونم نیستیم بیکار در حال ساخت و ساز ایران واسه این که خسته نشیم بار من خش بذارم تو سیما بعد این همه بارون خون بالاخره پیداش میشه رنگین کمون دیگه از سنگ اب نمیشه آسمون به سرخی لاله نمیشه آب جو معزن از آن بگو خدا بزرگ بلا به دور ماما امشب واسمون دعا بفر جای که یادم این خاک همیشه ندا میداد یه روز خوب میاد که هر جو مرج نیست و تو شلوغیا به جا پوش به هم شیرینی میدیم و زور بیا گامیه همه شنگولی و همه چیالیه فقط جای رفیقام که نیستن خالیه Iranian rap artist Hitchka, Yeruz Kub Miad, a good day will come. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're talking to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hirsch. His latest piece is online at The New Yorker magazine's News Desk blog. It's called Our Men in Iran, and it tells the story of a group still designated as terrorists by the State Department, the MEK, uh, which was trained um, at the Department of Energy's Nevada National Site, with its Arab high plains and remote mountain peaks um, has a look of northwest Iran. Uh, Sai Hirsch, why the Department of Energy? And again, this is under the Bush administration. They're labeled terrorists, but they are training them, uh, not only in communications, you point out. Um, they've had uh, there is a, a secret site. Uh, it's about sixty some odd miles um, um, out of Las Vegas, in the, deep in, in, in no man's land in, in, in southern Nevada, where we've been doing an awful lot of stuff for many years. There's a uh, it's called Site 12. Uh, that particular site, it, it, it's it's um, 
Um, our CIA and other agencies have been training foreign troops. It's where I, uh, I, I would guess uh, when we do joint training with the special units of the Israeli army and other units that we train, we do train foreign soldiers. We can fly to this base. It's, it's got a long landing strip, 7,500 feet, concrete landing strip. Uh, for a long time, it had uh, yellow crosses on it, which meant to, uh, for even aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft, in, in trouble, do not land here. And this is a, a strip that um, uh, you come in and you, you I, I presume, you come in in a military plane, you can turn off the transponder, nobody, no FAA's checking anything, nobody's going to get a tail number. You can land, and uh, there's a, a facility there, there's barracks and other work, other facilities, and Site 12 for, and, and a food hall. It's all, you can actually find it online if you go through the uh, Department of Energy's annual, uh, they, they provide annual environmental impact reports, and they describe what's going on in each site in terms of the environment, and there you get a pretty good description. In fact, they actually use the word, there's a training facility used for other government agencies, an OGA, other government agencies, is a long-standing phrase that means the CIA, essentially, uh, actually specifically to people on the inside. So there's been training there forever, and it just so happens, if you take a look at northwest Iran and take a look at the, the topography in that part of the desert in Nevada. It's a very arid area, I think 15 inches of rain or something like that a year. Uh, 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 it's got a desert, it's got uh, valleys, it's got uh, mountain ranges, and it really is similar. Uh, I'll tell you what the most frightening thing was. When they first began the training, um, one very senior four-star officer was called by somebody who knew about the training in Nevada, very worried about it. And um, uh, because the Joint Special Operations Command people were training in um, uh, not only in uh, uh, communications and cryptography, small unit tactics, but other cute things, uh, which to me, of course, and to my friend, uh, meant um, uh, interrogation tactics. You know, how to, you know, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't, I don't know this, but I presume included the standard sort of horrible stuff that we know American intelligence agencies have, uh, and uh, CIA and other personnel have done to various uh, 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 prisoners of war since 9-11, uh, waterboarding and the like. It was very troubling, uh, that message, um, uh, that this kind of uh, training is being done uh, on a group that's listed as a terrorist group. Uh, but so it goes. They and yet, so many public officials, Bush um, and Republican and Democrats, are calling for them to be taken off the list. Among the U.S. officials to speak in support of MEK is former Vermont Governor Howard Dean, speaking to CNN last year. He said the U.S. should lift the terror group designation to help protect MEK members living in Iraq. The FBI screened all these people. The FBI counterterrorist folks screened all these people. Uh, in 2006, not one of them is a terrorist, according to our FBI. This is outrageous what's going on. It's an outrageous behavior by the State Department. And frankly, the administration has res direct responsibility for making sure that the promises were kept. We kept one promise. That is, we, prom we kept George Bush's promise to get out by the end of uh, 2011. We need to keep the promise of the people of Ashraf. We ought not to be complicit in human rights massacres. Among those appearing at the public event in Washington on Friday in support of the MEK was Michael was Mitchell Reese, a former policy, a foreign policy advisor to Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney. He acknowledged to the crowd that the Treasury Department considers MEK supporters quote potential criminals. At a campaign stop in New Hampshire last year, an audience member asked Romney about Reese's support for the MEK. Have you heard of or do you support the MEK? I have, not heard, of, I have not heard of the MEK, and I, so I, I can't possibly tell you whether I support the MEK, but I can't. <laughs> All right? But what, what, is the, what, what is the MEK? Why, why would you think that I supported it? You said it's a terrorist group? There's been, there's a terrorist group in Iran which is um, uh, apparently violent. It's attacked uh, civilians before. Uh, it's called the MEK, the People's Mujahideen of Iran. And um, if you look into it, um, some of your staff members, I believe, have made statements to um, lobby the executive branch to remove them from the, the terrorist uh, list. I'll, I'll take a look at the uh, at the, uh, the issue. I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular group or, or that effort on the part of uh, any of my team. That was Mitt Romney being questioned about his foreign policy advisor, Mitchell Reese's support for the MEK. Uh, Seymour Hersh, your response. 
Well, I would say that the Obama administration has even more trouble than Mr. Romney does. I, 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 it's clear he didn't know much about it. This administration knows an awful lot about it because they have access to what was going on um, in the uh, previous administration in this area in terms of the MEK, in terms of operations inside Iran, and they're still going on. And so the question then becomes, um, I'm, I'm, um, uh, uh, I'm amazed that— um, um, we've had nothing from the White House about uh, this story, and um, there's also been sort of a—I uh, shouldn't complain about it because I understand it. It's, you know, it's not invented here syndrome, but uh, uh, I'm a little amazed that more reporters aren't asking more questions about this, because it seems to be so egregious. Uh, this is—right uh, uh, now, uh, our Treasury Department is actually asking questions, because no matter how you cut it, it's a terrorist group. And if you're aiding and supporting a terrorist group under the law of the United States, as you know, there's been some prosecutions in this area of, of people, um, uh, uh, people of Middle East descent um, um, uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, groups that we consider to be terrorists, and they get put away in jail. There certainly seems to be a double standard here at work. and. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, Romney seems lost in space on this issue, but I can assure you right now there are people in this White House who are not. Is the Obama administration still training MEK? I don't think the word is training anymore, because are we directly training them down in, in Nevada? No, I don't. There's no reason to believe that. I don't know that. I, I've been told that there, there is more stuff going on than, than we know of, of course, and that's also possible. You know, one of the things that— <laughs> that I, I've learned, I've been doing a book about Cheney for a, a number of years, it's just amazing how many things we really don't know about what our government can do. There are amazing things out there that happen um, that we just don't know about. And so they can keep secrets. Of course, the government would like to keep pressure on Iran uh, as much as it can. And I don't think we can totally walk away from uh, responsibility in terms of, at the minimum, we've been providing intelligence um, that we know goes to the MEK. Um, and also to other dissident groups inside, uh, inside Iran. Um, uh, does that mean we're aiding and abetting in the specific killing of somebody? No, I have no reason to believe that anybody can make that case. But w w what the hell are we doing in there? Um, why are we putting so much pressure? Why do we take so much pleasure uh, in bombings and explosions that take place inside Iran, um, uh, which may be linked to us? And uh, I, I, I just don't quite understand the policy. It's certainly not one that's conducive to having good negotiations in good faith. Um, the latest news that uh, nuclear talks in Turkey are taking place. Uh, talk about how the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, has found um, what they have found in relation to the nuclear program, and also Mohamed El Baradai. In a minute, we're going to be speaking to Shruf Abdul Kudus. Uh, Mohamed El Baradai, who is the, um, the Nobel Prize winning head of the IAEA, was going to run for president of Egypt, then pulled out. But what he he had to do with information that came from the MEK? Well, um, very early, the MEK was the first group to announce that, the, um, that they had discovered in, in 2002 they had a news conference. And by the way, at that point, they were considered, the MEK were always considered a cult group, very fringe, marginal, uh, irrational group. They'd been involved in the 70s, so we believe, in the killing of some Americans inside Iran. And they were a Marxist, leftist group uh, in opposition to the Shah that couldn't connect with uh, the mullahs, the religious uh, mullahs that took over uh, Khamenei uh, in those days. They couldn't connect with them, and they began a protracted struggle in which murder, murder, murder was all over the place, both sides killing each other, very brutal stuff. And so they were always considered to be uh, outside the normal realm uh, of, of, of groups and—, and um, uh, uh, it's suddenly, in 2002, they get a lot of street cred, credibility, because they announced that they, the Iranians are building a nuclear facility. They didn't say they were enriching uranium there, uh, but it was clear from the import of what they said. The only reason they're getting involved in building a facility for nuclear um, uh, uh, production was for weaponization. And I learned—I was told at the time that uh, Israel was behind that intelligence, that it really didn't come from the, the MEK themselves. Israel, as you know, there, there were, what, something like a million and a half Iranian Jews, many of whom fled the country when, when uh, the Shah fell. And Israel still has a pretty good net of intelligence net inside Iran. So it wasn't illogical. And I, I began to see um, Mr. El Barade 
the director general of the IAEA uh, pretty regularly, um, uh, certainly at least once a year, and talked to a lot of people there in Vienna about what was going on in terms of nuclear development around the world. And uh, this is a wise man. Uh, we didn't like him because he's Egyptian, but that was a big mistake. He turned out to be—he was enraged at Iran when I first began to talk to him about it. He thought they cheated. He was quite angry. But he also told me— um, I told him, we talked about the fact that I had heard that the Israelis were involved in providing that intelligence, and he also had heard the same thing. And, in fact, before this article was published uh, online for The New Yorker, uh, the fact-checkers went back to his office, to his secretary, and, and once again uh, reminded him of that conversation and got his permission to say uh, something he wouldn't let me say earlier, which is that he had provided me with that information, too. So Israel's had a tremendous role in supporting the MEK. I wouldn't be surprised if Israel was also deeply involved in helping us or abetting with the training inside uh, uh, in Nevada. That would make a lot of sense. And Israel certainly is a key player right now in the MEK activities, along with us, and for many years along with the Brits, who were also involved in providing signals intelligence inside Iran or collecting intelligence. Um, the good thing about having Britain around is they're actually more hated than we are in the Middle East because of their long history of exploitation. That's always a plus. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, barati has been, uh, he's been a, a very neutral arbiter of what was going on, very critical of Iran for many years. He eventually turned his position churned as he learned more, as the Iranians trusted him more, began to talk more to him and his people. And um, what we ha now have is he left a few years back. We have a new director general, a Japanese uh, so, sort of center-right politician named uh, Amato, uh, who is different. He's much closer to us. There's been WikiLeaks cables uh, uh, released by Julian Assange that show very clearly that we helped him get elected as director general. There was a, it's a U.N. agency, the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna that El Barade had for so many years. It's U.N., and the, the new leader was voted. I think there were seven ballots. And it was our, our ability to swing some votes that got Amano the job, and he immediately uh, told us how he would be different about Iran, et cetera. There's a whole series of WikiLeaks uh, uh, cables um, um, uh, about this uh, that, um, that uh, Julian's group released that are pretty devastating, that aren't enough in, in the American currency. They're there. They were published widely in the British press but not here. Uh, we really need to take a look at this relationship, because it, it, it raises a lot of questions uh, um, uh, uh, just about—I'll uh, be honest, I'm not sure we come into negotiations with very clean hands on this. And um, um, we begin negotiations really behind the eight ball with the Iranians, because they are very deeply involved. They have very good intelligence. They know what we've been doing. Uh, despite all this talk you have about Iranians being involved inside Afghanistan, um, right now, and all this talk about Iranians being involved inside Iraq and killing Americans, there's never been much of a case for that. And I will tell you right now, after 9-11, the Iranians were absolutely willing to work with us, particularly against al-Qaeda. Don't forget, Iran's Shia and al-Qaeda are mostly Sunni, Sunni fanatics, and there was no love lost. And they actually, in the first few six months or so after 9-11, they closed their borders and cap captured a lot of al-Qaeda that were being driven out of the country by us, and, and they were looking for refuge in Iran, and they've been jailed. I think they're still there in jail, over a hundred of them. And so we really blew a chance by putting them on the axis of evil. I'd sure like to do a, a takeover of American history after 9-11. I think the, the history books are going to be as bad as we think it is. It's worse. Seymour Hersh, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist for The New Yorker. His latest piece is online at their news desk blog. It's called Our Men in Iran. When we come back, another prize-winning journalist will be joined by our very own Democracy Now! correspondent, Sharif abdul -Kudus. He's just flown in from Cairo. He's heading up to Ithaca College this evening to give a major address as he receives the Izzy Award from the Park Center for Independent Media, named for the muckraking journalist I.F. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.
A Wish by the late Nubian Egyptian singer Hamza al -Din. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, as we turn to Egypt, where the former intelligence chief of ousted dictator Hosni Mubarak has joined the presidential race. Omar Suleiman announced his bid on Friday, well over a month before Egyptians head to the polls. Suleiman headed Egypt's intelligence services for more than 18 years, becoming a close U.S. ally and playing a key role in the Bush administration's extraordinary rendition program. During the Egyptian uprising last year, Mubarak appointed Suleiman his first-ever vice president before he was forced out of power. The presidential candidate for Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, Khairat al shatter criticized Suleiman's entry into the race. We strongly reject any attempt to restore the previous political regime in the same form and represented in the person of General Omar Suleiman. And we think that this is an insult to the revolution and shows a lack of awareness of the type of change that has taken place in the lives of the Egyptian people and its impact. But in terms of how to deal with this issue and having just one Islamist candidate, the issue is not about whether the candidates are Islamist or not. The issue is about the attempt to steal the revolution. And if any attempt is made to steal the revolution or to carry out fraud, then naturally ourselves and others will go out on the streets. Egypt's presidential elections begin May 23rd. With Suleiman's entry into the race, one of the most public faces of the Mubarak regime joins an already crowded presidential field in a critical vote for post-revolution Egypt. For more, we're joined by Sharif Abdel Kudus. He is based in Cairo, uh, Democracy Now! correspondent, fellow at the Nation Institute. He's here tonight to receive the Izzy Award for Special Achievement in Independent Media, named after the legendary maverick journalist. I.F. Stone, who launched I.F. Stone's Weekly in 1953 and exposed government deception, McCarthyism, racial bigotry. Sharif's being honored for his reporting on the Egyptian Revolution. In a statement, the Park Center for Independent Media said, with breathtaking bravery, Sharif's unflinching on-the-street reporting simultaneously brought us the voices and faces of Egyptians, the drama of the moment, and big-picture analysis, sometimes while tear gas or live rounds exploded in the background. That is Sharif Odoka. And he's here in studio. Welcome back to Democracy Now! here in New York. Sharif, it's Thank great you, to have Amy. you with it's us. It's good to be here. Um, talk about the elections. Well, as you mentioned uh, in the lead, Omar Suleiman uh, is the last candidate to join uh, the presidential race. Uh, he submitted his uh, candidacy papers 20 minutes before the window closed on Sunday. Uh, he, in fact, had said he wasn't going to run just days earlier, and then uh, reversed that decision. And uh, apparently, in one day, uh, obtained more than 70,000 signatures uh, for his candidacy, which is, uh, you know, more than double the 30,000 that's needed uh, to be an official candidate. Uh, it's ironic that he's running. I mean, this is the man uh, that Mubarak appointed as vice president uh, once the revolution began in a, in a bid to, to quell the uprising. Uh, during the 18-day uprising, he actually went on ABC in an interview and said Egyptians are not ready for democracy. Uh, now he's running for uh, president. Many consider him the candidate now uh, of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, which has uh, ruled Egypt since Mubarak's ouster on February 11th of last year. He's a career army officer that served with many of the two dozen generals that, uh, that serve on the military council. And as you mentioned, uh, since 1993, he's been the head of the General Intelligence Services uh, in Arabic that's known as the Mukhabarat, a very powerful intelligence position. He played a key role in suppressing the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists during Mubarak's era. He played a key role in, uh, in uh, Egypt's relationship with Israel, uh, helping to enforce the siege on Gaza, helping to crush Hamas through destroying the tunnels that provide a lifeline to Gaza. Uh, but, of course, also he uh, was the CIA's point man in Egypt for the Extraordinary Rendition Program and uh, uh, was involved, uh, by some accounts, actually in torture itself. Uh, one uh, prisoner who is an Egyptian-born Australian citizen by the name of uh, Mamdouh Habib, who was rendered to Egypt, where he was, uh, he says he was electrocuted, uh, hung from metal hooks, uh, suspended in water up to his nostrils. He was later sent to Guantanamo, where he was held for a number of years before being shipped back home to Australia without charge. Uh, he penned a memoir, and he said at one point uh, that while he was being interrogated, the interrogator slapped him so hard 
heard that the blindfold dislodged uh, of his eye and sitting in front of him was Omar Suleiman. Uh, Omar Suleiman was also the liaison for the CIA in the rendition of uh, Ibn Sheikh al Libi, who, of course, uh, played a key role in the Bush administration's administra uh, justification uh, for the war in Iraq. So uh, that's his background, and he has now entered the race. It has caused uh, widespread outrage uh, in Egypt. Uh, calls for protests have already begun for a big protest on Friday against his candidacy. Uh, a committee in parliament has approved a law. This is not approved by the parliament yet, just a committee putting it forward to ban any former regime members who served in top-level positions f uh, in the f last five years leading up to Mubarak's ouster from running in the presidential election. Uh, it's not understood whether this will actually pass, especially after the nomination window closed. But that's where it stands right now. And uh, I don't know what kind of backing he would have popularly. I mean, let's remember that on February 10th, Mubarak actually, the day before Mubarak stepped down, he tried to pass over all his constitutional powers uh, to the vice president, to Omar Suleiman, and this was met with widespread disapproval. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. But another key person that is running in the presidential race, as you mentioned, and we heard a clip of him uh, in the lead, was Khairat al-Shatir. Khairat al-Shatir is... Uh, probably uh, the most powerful member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he is uh, a multimillionaire business tycoon who was jailed for 12 years, a total of 12 years, during Mubarak's era. He ran the Muslim Brotherhood largely from his prison cell. Uh, he was released by the Supreme Council of Armed Forces in March of last year. Uh, his nomination actually caused outrage as well, because it reversed a pledge by the Muslim Brotherhood not to field a presidential candidate. This is their pledge early on in the process. Uh, as we know, they dominate. Uh, they have about 50 percent of the seats in the, in the legislature. Uh, they've dominated uh, the Constituent Assembly, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. And they have now said they're going to field a candidate. They actually kicked out uh, uh, a key member, uh, Abdul Munam Abu Futuh, who is a liberal Islamist thinker, uh, favored by many uh, youth and revolutionary figures, especially after the withdrawal of Muhammad al Baradai. They kicked him out of the Muslim Brotherhood because he decided to run against their pledge, and now they're fielding uh, this candidate. Uh, in fact, also, it's unclear. I mean, this is all part of Egypt's very confusing and erratic transition plan that's been headed by the Supreme Council. We don't know if Khairat al-Shatir will be allowed to run. He has this military court ruling against him. He was pardoned by Tantawi. But uh, another candidate, Ayman Noor, who ran against Mubarak in 2005, a court just ruled that even though he received a pardon, he can't run. So uh, the Brotherhood have now fielded a backup candidate, a man named Mohamed Morsi, who's the head of their party, uh, just in case. So uh, this is where we're— And a candidate whose mother is an American citizen? Well, this, this was another—I mean, it's hard to keep up with everything that's happening in Egypt, but this is Hazm Abu Smail, who's a, a, a Salafi uh, preacher. Salafis are uh, practice an ultra-conservative uh, form of Islam. They won about 25 percent of parliament in the elections uh, late last year. Uh, so he w had widespread support. He also, uh, while he was a Salafi preacher, he also was very critical of the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. So he tapped into this uh, section of Egyptian society that uh, is very religiously conservative, but also against the military council. Uh, he obviously is uh, quite anti-American in his rhetoric, and it's very ironic because uh, the, the, the law right now in Egypt is that you can't run as a presidential candidate if you're, you have to be born uh, two Egyptian parents, and neither of them can have ever had uh, any foreign citizenship. It turns out that uh, uh, Hazm Abu Smail's mother uh, did get uh, American citizenship. His sister was married to an American, and he, she would come visit, uh, visit her here. And uh, it turns out the Presidential Elections Commission has received confirmation that he was an American citizen. The New York Times reported that she was actually registered to vote in California. And so he's not allowed to run anymore, and uh, he's calling for mass protests uh, of his own. You recently uh, wrote a piece for The Nation, Egypt's Looming Economic Shock Doctrine. Right. Uh, what's happening right now is that Egypt's, Egypt's on, the, on the edge of an economic crisis, uh, and this has been really the result of a badly mismanaged political transition. Uh, the issue is that we've been backed into a corner with, with the issue of foreign currency reserves. Egypt uh, relies very heavily on imports for many of its staple items, including wheat. Uh, Egypt is the biggest importer of wheat in the world, relying on about 60 percent uh, for domestic consumption. 
on imports. So, uh, but we're running out of foreign currency, which we used to buy these imports, uh, because there's been a, uh, a big decline in foreign, in foreign direct investment and in tourism, which are main inputs for foreign currency. And uh, so what has happened right now is we have about $15 billion left in foreign currency reserves. That's, a, that's about left for three months of imports. Uh, we've spent all this money to try and keep the Egyptian pound where it is to prop up the currency. But if we do have to devalue the Egyptian pound, then all these imports would become uh, very expensive and would uh, severely deepen uh, Egypt's recession. So what's, uh, what's happening right now is that the Egyptian government formally requested the IMF for a loan in January, a $3.2 billion loan from the IMF. Now, what the IMF does now is not impose direct conditionality as they used to with these structural adjustment programs. But what they have asked for is that the government put forward an economic reform package, which they then must agree to, to uh, release the funds. Uh, so this is kind of an indirect conditionality. The government reform package uh, was was uh, drawn up by this uh, SCAF-appointed, military-appointed government. Uh, it was not open to public debate whatsoever. Uh, a copy was leaked to the media. Very poorly written economic report. And instead of—let's uh, remember this revolution uh, was, was sparked in large part for, because of economic grievances. The revolutionary calls of bread, freedom, social justice, two of those are essentially economic uh, uh, calls. And uh, the policies put forward in this economic reform package uh, go much further towards uh, promoting Mubarak-era policies that people, uh, in part, revolted against than to promoting uh, social justice. Uh, so there is a, there's a talk of uh, including expanding the sales tax, which puts really the burden uh, on the majority poor, because they pay more uh, for basic staple items. There's a uh, talk of energy of subsidy reform, but no talk of uh, which subsidies are going to be targeted. Egypt has about 30 percent of its budget spent on subsidies. So. Uh, it's, uh, but, but we're putting in a position where we really need to take uh, some kind of foreign currency loan. And so it's—I uh, it, it, it's, mean, the reason it's called the looming economic shock doctrine is because we're in a position where uh, we've been backed into a corner, and it's unclear exactly what— uh, budgetary and fiscal policies are going to be accepted to take this loan. Sharif, on a recent visit to Cairo, U.S. Congressmember David Dreyer and other U.S. lawmakers met uh, with Egyptian parliamentarians, also with the Muslim Brotherhood presidential candidate, um, uh, Herat al -Shatter. And Congressman Dreyer told reporters during a news conference, future U.S. aid to Egypt remains uncertain, given the ruling military council's crackdown on pro-democracy groups, including some U.S. groups. We know that the decision that Secretary Clinton made is going to see a uh, continuation uh, of, uh, of assistance, the, the $1.3 billion in military assistance and the $250 million in civilian assistance, that that uh, assistance is going to be continuing now. But uh, with um, challenges that lie ahead, questions that, uh, that, uh, that exist, there is no certainty uh, about that. That will be a decision that we in the United States Congress will make. And again, I can't predetermine the outcome. Egypt was the biggest recipient of USAID after Israel. Well, Congress passed a law that uh, Egypt has that they have to prove that Egypt is going on a democratic path to release the funds. But the Obama administration actually waived that on national security grounds and has continued uh, the same policies of uh, many U.S. administrations in providing military to aid to Egypt. Uh, so we'll have to see where that goes. Uh, one thing I want to mention before uh, we run out of time is that there was news that just broke just before we went to air. Uh, again, throwing Egypt's political uh, process in, up in the air, that a, uh, a court has ruled that the the panel that the parliament has drafted, a hundred member panel to write up the country's next constitution, uh, has been uh, has has been suspended completely. Uh, so that, that, that ruling can be appealed, but it's been suspended because uh, the parliament that's, that's dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood decided that they would have 50 of its own members on this 100-member panel, 50 parliament members on the panel. Uh, about 60 percent of the people on this 100-member panel uh, were in some way uh, affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood or, Sal or the Salafi movement. And so this caused outrage. About two dozen or a quarter of the of the panel's members have walked out from similar, uh, from uh, secular and liberal forces, including uh, the the Coptic Christian Church, including Al Azhar, uh, the Sunni uh, 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 in learning institution. So uh, right now we we don't know where we stand uh, in terms of the constitution, where the elections stand. Uh, Egypt's 
revolution still is uh, up in the air. Well, Sharif, I'm looking forward to hearing you give a talk tonight, and I hope folks come out at Ithaca College. Um, he will be receiving the Izzy Award for his reporting in Egypt. The event is open to the public, 730 Emerson Suites Phillips Hall, Ithaca College. Congratulations, Sharif. I'm Amy Goodman.